Yeah. Um, all right. So, hey, everyone. This is uh, TIPH Book Club's first uh, video discussion. And uh, we are discussing the book, like uh, Laura is showing in the uh, background, The Ten Year War by Jonathan Kahn. And um, yeah, so today is like part one of the book is divided into three parts. So today we are discussing part one, I think around like 100, 180 to 100 pages or so. And um, we'll quickly introduce ourselves and then we can just jump in the discussion. So my name is Nikita Wagle. I'm a PSC candidate at Texas a &M School of Public Health. Um, I'm the Department of Health Policy and Management, which is why I was like interested in this book. Um, so yeah. Um, Laura, you can go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. Sure, yeah. My name is Laura Bryson. Um, I am a Master of Public Health student at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. I wish I was in the health policy program. <laughs> um, I'm in community health practice, but I hope to take my career towards health policy. So I, that's why I'm also interested in this book. Awesome. Uh, so, okay, I can go ahead and start the discussion and then you'll see how it flows down from there. Yeah. So. Um, one of the really cool things that I noticed when I started reading the book was the fact that the health policy, uh, healthcare policy debate is not new. And by new, I mean, like, it doesn't like start from the major reforms that we know, but it runs like deeper than that. So like, um, the book says about how since 1920s, when the medicine entered modern era began, like the debate of like the whole healthcare policy stuff. So that was something really cool that I got me like interested in the book to read more and more as to how things have evolved from like then since gradually now. Yeah, cool. Good introduction, Nikita. Um, <clears throat> I totally agree. Um, and it's interesting to think about how we're seeing the same trends play out still today and how those formative year, well, I shouldn't say formative because we've had our government parties for you know hundreds of years, but in terms of healthcare policy in those formative years, um, we still kind of think about the same two sides and the butting heads. So on one side you have like market justice, which is favored by conservatives, right? So they, mostly believe that public programs are inefficient, stifles the effects of market competition, and they're unjust because they rob people of hard-earned money. Um, and so that side is the demand side or price side rationing, so insurance and coverage is limited, and that's why so many millions don't have coverage. Um, whereas the more liberal view um, favors social justice as opposed to market justice. So. Um, typically, people on this side believe that healthcare is a human right and that public sector programs are more efficient and equitable and humane um, than private sector alternatives. And so that turns into supply side rationing. So pricing and availability of services is limited. Um, I saw this come up multiple times in the book, probably the most direct, I would say, um, relationship was um, during the chapter comparing like McCain to Obama um, when they were both running. And so McCain labeled healthcare as a responsibility that the government shouldn't be um, responsible for guaranteeing it to everybody, but Obama, it should be a right for every American. Yeah, this whole uh, concept of like healthcare being an absolute right of the people to where it's like, people thinking that it's a privilege, like this whole um, tug of war has been continuing since a long time. Like it was really cool for me to see, especially like and as an international student, like, so I mainly focus on like Medicare, Medicaid and all of that. And that, that was discussed in the book and everything, but it was really cool for me to see that whatever we see right now, like all the misinformation around like healthcare, um, like for example, like the misinformation around like COVID vaccines and everything, 
and this like fear mongering and misinformation is kind of not new it has been used as a tool to kind of sway public opinion on things and then i remember i think from the book where they say that um there was something about the clinton health plan but the damage was uh, was it about harry and lewis ads that they said that they did these ads did a sub, like a lot of damage and the damage could not be recovered because it is it are already swayed like public opinion so that was something that i noted that has continued since a long time and like we see these like how you mentioned we see these patterns going again and again um so that was really interesting to me um yeah i thought that was definitely a theme throughout the whole part one was that fear mongering used to scare Americans away from healthcare. And even today, when you talk to people about why are you against universal healthcare, it's, well, it's not my responsibility. It's like everyone else's individual responsibility and I don't want my money paying for someone else. Um, and that started like Nikita had said so many years ago. So like comparing US health programs to socialism during the cold war. Oh yeah. We'll see that today. People are scared of socialism ideals and, and things like that. And then the Harry and Louise acts adds um, attacking government health care, probably also, also fueled um, mistrust of government and news sources. Um, and then obviously lobbying from pharmaceutical and insurance industries, claiming that the Clinton plan um, regulations and reductions in payments would stymie innovation, um, like depriving people of potentially life-saving cures. Um, so literally telling people that universal health care like might prevent them from seeing new health care innovations. So yeah, and this whole concept of like um too much government intrusion into like lives of people. Um yeah again that team is present even now where like for universal coverage or what so it's important for everyone to know that medicare for all is not a new concept it has been not called medicare for all but it was always there like since the 1920s people have been talking about like universal health care coverage and everything um so yeah i mean uh, that that argument goes like even today and like the cool part of the book is like how con kind of um dedicates like parts and bits of like every player so we'll talk about romney he'll talk about clinton he'll talk about kennedy he'll talk about obama like all these like how these things come together um it's pretty interesting yeah i know one of the things you had mentioned earlier nikita when we were talking is like how backstories of the presidents have shaped their healthcare reform efforts. So oh, yes. like Nixon had two brothers who died from tuberculosis. Yes. That's one of the reasons. Yes. And President Obama's mom had cancer. She died uh, with that. So yeah, I mean. Um, and I think Kennedy had several children with um, severe health problems as well. So it translated directly, I feel like. Yeah, that was really cool for me to think about like how these backstories or like even uh, presidential health for that matters, like affects healthcare policy. Um, it's not, so when whenever there's a decision about healthcare policy, it's just not like, okay, we want to decide about this one thing, but how that one thing affects the other stuff or what is going on. And like, I remember in the book, they talk about, this uh, other healthcare policy, which was, so, sorry, other policy, which was going on, I think something about Canada, Mexico, some stuff, and how that kind of was like affecting the like healthcare policy and like that whole back and forth of things that was also really cool for me to read about. So, yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to hear people's um, opinions of it whenever we do the discussion posts, so. Yeah, so I think right there. we are at almost 10 minutes. Okay, 
Um, one more thing I wanted to mention, just so we can kind of end on like a semi-positive note for our part. <laughs> one. Um, one last theme that I noticed throughout the entire part one was the bipartisanship efforts and compromise and how that was literally pretty much the only driving factor towards actually passing legislation yes. that yes. resembled like universal health care. So yeah. um, with the Clinton um, campaign, the focus of the new Democrats was to try to persuade um, Southern Republicans who were more conservative um, and figuring out how to compromise to get them on board with that like competition under the cap um, plan. And then, I mean, they spent several chapters talking about Romney and Massachusetts and Kennedy in Massachusetts. And yes, yeah. how both of them were said up front, like, I am willing to compromise to get these bills passed so we can, you know, create change. And of course, there were other factors that sort of like aligned with the stars to help them do that. Like Massachusetts already had a plan for um, people with pre-existing conditions. So it was a little bit easier for them to get it passed. And um, they were on the line to lose millions or billions of dollars from um, federal, federal funding. So both parties, I mean, they knew that they needed to take action, but ultimately it was compromise that um, led to the passing of their near universal health care plan in Massachusetts. So that was, yeah. that was positive <laughs> part. And of I think like one quote that you mentioned really um, that day was uh, kind of stayed with me was the fact that you cannot have a big social change without bipartisan support um, and you need it to be lasting. So kind of getting to universal health care, which is kind of a big piece. Um, of social legislation. So yeah, we have to have bipartisan support. Yeah. And we can see how that plays out. It's super interesting. Yeah, and I'm sure that we'll see that going into part two. Yes. All right, so I think we are at the end of our discussion for this part. And I, Laura and I really hope that y'all will um, have already read the book or you all will read the book and find it super interesting and engage with us um, on the Goodreads. We'll be posting two questions and I hope that we can foster a really good discussion. Cool. Yeah. Thanks guys for tuning in. We will also be releasing a second video when we finish with part two um, in about three weeks. All right. Bye everyone.